Welcome back, everyone, for our next talk, uh, which is going to be by Timo Budenbender. Um, he's a business admin grad uh, who volunteers a bunch of his time to promote Co-op 2.0 with the goal of ensuring that corporations actually contribute to a more fair and sustainable economy. Um, he'll be talking about this uh, now. So welcome to Timo. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mitch. So can you hear me? Is the volume right? Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks to the organizers to uh, invite me in a very short uh, term period. I'm going to talk about the Cooperative 2.0. And um, I think this could also be interesting here from a second angle. Um, some of you might have projects where uh, this model could also be interesting to, yeah, as a legal form for the realization. So <coughs> Cooperative 2.0, um, you see this nice logo of Fanopoli. Fanopoli is the pioneer company. Um, the foundation of Fanopoli was the, the occasion where this company model was invented. And that's why it's, uh, yeah, it's logical and I think it's also necessary to explain the model at the concrete example of Fanopoli. So at the beginning, I will give you uh, an idea of what is Fanopoli, so that afterwards you can uh, understand um, as good as I um, yeah, understand best what uh, the components are that this model is made of, how I work together, so on. And then I hope that we'll have a vivid discussion. We'll not have all the um, questions at the end, but when I go into the model itself and you have a question, just raise your arm and we'll um, do it directly, okay? So, <coughs> Fanopoli is an online marketplace that's a cooperative uh, company, obviously, which is based in Berlin. It's a startup. It's not even one year old. Or, yeah, the company itself is more than one year old, but the marketplace has gone online in September of 2013. And, uh, yeah, you just have an insight into the lab of the developers, and you see they are also quite active in the outside world to promote the idea and the company. And even though all the direct employees of Fanopoli are located in Berlin, um, we had a lot of activities already here in Hamburg and also in other cities. You will learn later on why that is the case, why there are people like me who are standing here to promote this, uh, this model and the idea. And yeah, you can see that besides uh, talks like this, where there's the founder, Felix, of all this, we also had other activities like clothes uh, sharing, or in this case, you could share everything. Um, yeah, we're quite a group of people here in Hamburg. So <clears throat> that's basically the marketplace. Um, the idea is to, be, is to create and establish a fair alternative to the big players with their monopolistic structures. So Amazon and eBay, uh, they are on the one side, and we want to uh, distinguish ourselves with some features on the marketplace. You can see here there are filter options, uh, like with one click you can make a fair trade or an organic product mar marketplace out of Fanopoli. Um, but I won't go into too many details of the marketplace because that's not uh, the topic of this talk. Um, and what mainly distinguishes us from these big players is the company model that ensures that not only a few investors can uh, get benefits out of it, but as many people as possible. So <clears throat> together with that, you won't be surprised to hear that Fanopoli um, is basically based on crowdfunding um, campaign so far. It was really a pioneer in that, not only in the way of cooperative companies, but also overall in Germany. That was at the beginning of 2013, and uh, that time it was, I think, the ba second biggest campaign in Germany with more than 200,000 euros. So, yeah, it was a big start. So, and I will give you some overviews on the um, legal form of the cooperative, because it has some built-in features that make it the best uh, point to start for the way uh, for the company model that we want to build. Um, maybe in theory you can build all those features that you will see later on also in a share-based company or uh, whatever, but here we have some things uh, from the start that really uh, fit with our values. That is the democratic aspect of the um, cooperative. Normally you have a rule like one euro, one vote, and here you have one man, one vote, or one woman, one vote, one human being, one vote. 
that's um, what distinguishes the um, cooperative. And also, you become a member of this company. You don't become a shareholder, so you have nothing that you can um, sell. Um, I don't know if you have heard of those statistics, like uh, the average share on the stock exchange uh, is uh, resold after 22 seconds. That's quite funny, I think, but uh, that shows that uh, there's no real um, yeah, link to the real economy anymore. And here, you become a member. You can't sell it, you can't sell it with a profit, you can't do speculation, so all this nasty part of the financial markets is something that you don't have when you deal with a cooperative corporation. And um, just to uh, talk against some prejudices that are widespread, especially in Germany, against this uh, quite old uh, form of companies, um, a lot of people say it's uh, bureaucratic, uh, it's basic democratic, everyone has to decide everything, you can't really act quickly. This is not the case. The management board can decide. It's the task of the management board to decide. And the other, um, the supervisory board and all the members, they can control, they can um, suggest, but uh, they don't have to decide on every day and even on, on yeah, basic uh, strategic decisions. So it is flexible, it can act. Okay. So now I will explain this uh, special model, um, and yeah, now if you have any questions to, to the points that I will present you, just raise your hand and we'll do it at once. That uh, was the best version in the discussion that we had so far. So um, maybe one more word, why do we call it uh, 2.0? Well, at first that's a name that, is, uh, that suits well the business that Fanopoli does. Um, but also, it's uh, really the intention to make this uh, cooperative company model uh, more modern, to bring it into the Internet age. So the first and really the central characteristic is uh, that there are basic principles, basic principles that are protected, that cannot be easily changed. I um, gave you some quotations from... Um, the Statute of Fanopoli, it's available in German only. Uh, I'm sorry for that, but I will translate it quickly. There are 12 of them in total, and here you see three examples. So this basically says that the company shall behave in a fair way towards everyone, be it internally, the employees, as for example, a range of one to three concerning the salary, so no one may earn more than three times more than the lowest income inside the company and also on the outside, towards everyone, partners, customers, or well, other stakeholders um, affected by the activities of the company. This number four says that Fernopoli shall choose options that save the climate and the environment. And number 10, which is also uh, important, is that this Fernopoli company is obliged to foster the fight against corruption. So, for example, on the marketplace, when you sell, you have to pay a fee. That's uh, how the um, business model works. But besides that percentage, there's another percent, which we call the fair percent, which goes directly to, uh, at the moment, it's Transparency International, so that's NGOs, with a focus on transparency and fight against corruption. Those 12 principles, open source is one of them as well, which I did not quote here, those 12 principles are guaranteed by the statute, I would even say perpetuated by the statute. Um, it takes a majority of nine-tenths to change them. So um, there's really the intention to keep them forever, um, to prevent a minority or a small majority of changing that in a few years. Now we have already uh, 1,800 uh, members in the the cooperative, so you can imagine nine-tenths of that, even if not everyone participates in the general meeting. Um, that is a lot, and it will certainly grow more, so those basic principles, I would dare to say it's uh, yeah, quite impossible to get them away, and it's also not possible to buy the company with a lot of people who have one vote and then uh, change uh, uh, the whole identity of it. So directly linked to this first point and the fairness towards everyone is that uh, yeah, 
and accountability follows. So if you really want to act fair and sustainable in every way, then everyone who is concerned um, does, already, does also have the right to control you, to yeah, get a in transparent insight, and you are accountable towards all those groups. So basically, this point number two. Um, independence of vested interests. As I said, this uh, company model wants to create something that benefits a maximum of people and not just a few investors, also not only the founders. Um, so we have some um, mechanisms there. I already said this cooperative is a very good start because you cannot buy a majority. You can, um, yeah, if you are a member, you, you have paid the minimum amount of 50 euros, so that's already a very low threshold with the intention to get as many people as possible um, into the, the cooperative. But also the maximum is really low, it's 25,000 euros, 500 parts. So <coughs> um, if you think a little about it, an investor who does that just for money and who might have normally the, uh, an interest or a motivation to go to the, to the management board and influence them on what they should do. Um, he doesn't have any motivation here. There's not, simply not enough money that he can get out of it. There are dividends, we will see that later on, but uh, yeah, you can calculate that yourself. 25,000 euros, even a yield of 20% is, uh, yeah, is quite a little small amount for those big investors. So uh, yeah, what's the point for them? to argue the whole year with the management board to get some decisions influenced um, if the amount they could get more out of their share is yeah, really small compared to what they can get out of normal corporations if they have a big influence. Also, the idea is that no one shall, shall um, get an influence via a big share of money inside the total capital. So imagine if a single person had financed this company with um, half of the money it has and threatens to withdraw the money, then uh, even without a formal right to take decisions, it would get a big influence. And of course, this is not possible if this maximum cap is at such a low amount. All right, <clears throat> another really central aspect is its transparency. Um, yeah, basically everything shall be visible towards everyone, the members, the customers, but in fact, everyone who has an internet access, and well, I admit some German language uh, knowledge is not bad in the context of Fanopoli, <laughs> but uh, yeah, in general, you can um, imagine any company that uh, publishes all those things in the mother language is really open to the whole country. So we see business KPIs. Um, in the case of Fanopoli, there's one site, transparent or transparency in German fanopoli.de and there you can see all the numbers or you see further links to the next numbers number of users number of revenue numbers of transactions so on the tax declarations and the annual statements will be there as well and by the way another of the 12 principles is that they don't use any models to avoid taxes and they pay taxes locally uh, the wage level as well Activities and partners, okay, that's not so exceptional, but also views on their strategies. They g give uh, regular updates on their blog. Another special point um, that may not be obvious is this orientation towards common welfare. Maybe some of you have heard of what we call in German Gemeinwohlökonomie. It's less known in, in English. There it's called uh, econo economy for the common welfare. Um, but it basically has a second balance sheet. So Fanopoli at the moment is doing not only the financial balance sheet that is uh, mandatory, but also uh, second balance uh, based on common welfare. So this balance will be published and then you can see in what way the corporation is really oriented towards uh, the welfare of all the stakeholders it deals with. And something really innovative, which we will see another slide, is uh, due to the open bank project. So there are basically two accounts, and you can see all the movements in the accounts in the internet, everyone who wants. So this is an extract from some weeks ago. I bet if you went there, we would see the movements of last week. This is an uh, 
Well, the Open Bank project is basically an interface, and uh, some banks, um, well, some sustainable banks, they have already provided possibility to uh, yeah, plug into that, and Fanopoli was one of the first companies, if not even the first one, who did that. And so, limited by the German um, yeah, data protection laws, you can see everything that works there. Goes on. So, everyone can see that, and everyone can also make comments and ask questions. And if you wonder, well, who shall control all that? Who shall get interested in that? We had already some <laughs> interesting discussions when um, some of the anonymous data was then replaced by hand. All has, has to be done by hand. Um, by the name of a company who agreed to uh, be visible here. And um, that was, for example, a tech, a regional tech group in Eastern Germany. And some people asked, well, uh, you didn't declare that you would uh, um, support a tech. Is that your political mission? Or what did you do there? And then by the explanation that such a talk like I'm doing now was organized with a local tech group, and they had paid the room, and they were just reimbursed the room, by this explanation, this case was, was cleared up. But uh, yeah, there are people who ask if um, some points appear a little strange. So transparency is really fundamental. And now I come to the point uh, of the profits. You may um, argue about the uh, player question. I see some hands who are raised half. Okay. Um, <coughs> you may argue whether uh, companies should make profits or not. We have this discussion sometimes during the talks. In this case, we have taken the decision to be a basically um, profit-oriented company, and we don't see profits as something negative. Um, but um, the important point is that the profits don't go into the pockets of just a few people. But um, yeah, if you do good things with the profits for a lot of people and so on, then it's OK. And that's basically what we want to do here. That concerns the three points on the slides. Um, I don't think they are um, understandable by their own. But we have a certain model. Uh, yeah, <coughs> you saw on the internet side this cake picture. And that's, it was designed because we have this four quarters model of the revenue distribution. So this is all about the profits after tax. So investments in the companies and so on is before. Uh, no worry about the development of the company. That's all the profits after tax that are uh, or will be distributed, hopefully, one day um, according to this model. So one quarter is what uh, simply the members of the cooperative get. That's what I said. Even if you have 25,000 euros, uh, then you may get even a lot in percentage, but not a big amount. The second uh, thing is, uh, yeah, it's one of the reasons why we have so many people all over Germany, it's around 300, who help to make this model and the company known and yeah, help to spread the word without a big marketing uh, budget and without classical uh, advertisement, which we don't really like. Um, <coughs> there's a Fair founding point system. Fair founding points means that the people who, at the beginning of the company, who help without getting paid for that, they can collect those points. So there's basically two groups who are concerned of that. That's the employees. They are overtime hours, but also in a lot of cases they are regular hours, which are unpaid uh, sometimes because there's simply not enough uh, funding. Um, yeah, they get points for that. That's 200 points per hour. They put that into a system. And yeah, it's the same for other people like me. There are, like I said, 300, around 300 people in Germany who do that in their free time, starting from helping the programming of the software um, yeah, up to organizing whatever uh, or doing talks. So. Whatever you do when you're on that program, when you volunteer, you just yeah, write the times, and then you get 200 points. And later on, 25% will be distributed on this total amount, amount of points. So 
in the case that I'm so eager that I have 10% of those points distributed, I will get 10% of the 25%. This is all capped, so um, first there cannot be more than 10 million points collected overall. And um, the other thing is if a certain user number is reached, that means that the company is kind of established, so usually should be able to pay the people who work for it in a fair way, then this program is also stopped because it's um, yeah, just a, a help to get started, but the normal intention is, of course, to pay everyone in a fair way. And it's limited to 10 years, so after 10 years, there will hopefully have been enough of that, and that we'll have a three-third uh, model. Yeah, that's this number six here. Everyone who helps at the beginning has the chance to get rewarded uh, later on. It's a risk, but we all hope it will work. The third quarter will be a uh, donation to uh, NGOs, and it's the user who will determine which organization exactly will get the money. That's uh, I don't know, the fair share point system, which, well, is half in place. It, it will be... Um, further developed in the rest of the year. But the idea basically is that the people who buy on the marketplace and who buy used products or products that are labeled fair, they get fair share points and then they can yeah, redistribute the fair share points not to themselves but to a pool of, a pool of NGOs who are listed. And the NGOs will get their quarter of the shares at the uh, end of the uh, quarter of the profits according to what the users decided. And the last um, quarter goes uh, yeah, for especially international projects. That means uh, the vision is not only to have a competition for the big players in Germany, but ideally in the whole world. And to build up new cooperatives in other countries, it needs uh, help for the start. And that's going to be a, a pool or a funding pool for activities abroad. There are already contacts in other countries. There are interests. I, I cannot tell when the first other countries will start. Um, but of course, once we have uh, certain fundings available to help them, not only with the co code of the company and the marketplace, also with money, it will be easier to start that. OK, so much for the profits that we don't have yet. but. Uh, <laughs> this stage of the company, that would be a miracle to already have them. The last three um, attributes are listed here. And point number eight has a feature that you won't find in a lot of companies. Um, this democratic control by the employees means um, basically that it's the employees who um, elect the management board. So, um, yeah, there are some reasons why we did that. From our point of view, it's the employees who know best the market, the customer. They have the daily contact towards their economic environment. And they definitely know it better than some uh, yeah, anonymous investors or also the supervisory board who usually nominates the management board. And also the idea is to create a, a really good climate, a climate where people want to work. I mean, this is not a company where you get rich by working there. Thirdly, as I said, uh, we don't have to talk about it, but also later on you can imagine that this company is not to attract people who want to make a big career and drive the biggest cars. Um, but on the other hand, it shall create a climate where there's no uh, yeah, fundamental um, clinch between the employees and the management board. I don't know who of you works in a big company or has friends who works in big companies. There, in my experience, you often have a situation where the management board just uh, does things that yeah, suit best for their personal uh, target agreement, um, but to, which are not understood by the, you know, by the employees who have to apply those decisions afterwards. So here, if that happens, the employees have the right to... Yeah, make an extraordinary assembly and say, no, we finished the period of the management board. That's an emergency break. Our hope is it will never uh, turn out to be used because 
the management board knows that and then acts uh, in a way that also suits the, the employees and not act against the employees. Well, then we have a point which we saw already in part. We use the magic of the crowd wherever we can. So <coughs> the crowdfunding companies, of course, uh, the crowdfunding, not companies, uh, campaigns, of course, then also this, um, while it's called hero program, those 300 people who come from the crowd and who help where they can, but also with a lot of feedback uh, mechanisms. Um, yeah, it's not only in the open bank projects we, where we have interesting discussions and also a lot of suggestions on where um, this project can get better uh, and how it should develop. I mean, imagine if the big um, marketplaces that are the leaders today, if they had uh, always developed um, themselves according to what the users wanted, if they had gathered so much feedback from users, it would maybe be a uh, little different today, uh, with less advertisement and so on, by the next 10 star, uh, things, if you like this one, for example. Um, and that's, yeah, that's an intelligence that we want to use here. And the last of the 10 uh, points, which is certainly of a special interest for you here, is uh, the idea of making it all open source. And while well, open source is a little limited to the code itself, um, yeah, I switch to the slide now. The project itself is, uh, of course, open source. It's from, from GitHub, which you probably know better than me. Um, but also, <coughs> we want to extend that idea of open, open source to yeah, other aspects. That's why we speak of open innovation, which means that basically everything, every knowledge that the company acquires during its lifetime and shall be made available to everyone who uses it with the same open source license. So, um, yeah, all the ideas that are created <coughs> shall be made available like this. To give you one example, there's a, well, a work group, I would say, there's a voluntary work group that uh, thinks about the possibility to integrate the local stores into this model, because what we don't want is to further boost the, uh, um, extinct, uh, the vanishing, the, the disappearing of all the local bookstores and so on. So once there is a viable model on that, we won't claim that for Fanopoly only, but we will make it available to any other company who wants to use it and who does not want to make it proprietary themselves. And last but not least, this uh, whole model, uh, Cooperative 2.0, um, is also in the spirit of this. Uh, I should maybe ask Natalia if a company model can be uh, concerned by a patent. I don't know. I don't think so. But some years ago, I also thought that some biological things like life. Hmm? Yes, but this, this whole bunch of 10 attributes, could this be protected? No, we don't want patents. <laughs> so, uh, let's hope it's, uh, it cannot be made a patent. Uh, but anyway, it's the idea to really uh, foster that, to boost that into the, the economy. Um, so, um, yeah, copying that is not only permitted, but uh, expressly wanted. And um, fortunately, there are already three companies in Germany, three um, other startups, who have adopted it a little but who have started on this model too. That is another software company who makes a structure for discussions. It's a, um, a platform uh, which is called Patu. Um, you certainly know Liquid Democracy, and Patu is uh, the company who runs Liquid Democracy. And just some days ago, the first online general uh, meeting of Fanopoli ended, and it was run on the, the Patu platform. And the fourth one, I don't uh, remember the name, is then an offline uh, company. They do fair uh, logistics in Berlin with uh, heavy bikes. So, um, yeah, that's it for now. But, uh, yeah, as many companies as want, and the more the better, we really want to bring this into the economy. And, yeah, we hope it can be a lever to really push the whole economy towards a fairer and more sustainable um, uh, mode of operation. In Germany, but also internationally, 
even though I don't know the cooperative um, yeah, legislation um, internationally. So that was GitHub, and <coughs> yeah, where's the this company is standing at the moment? Fanopoli. That was during the second big um, crowdfunding campaign uh, at the end of last year, at the beginning of this year. That was really a, a tough race. In the end, we got the minimum threshold, but uh, we missed the the big goal, and yeah, that's why now this uh, these fair founding points apply often also for the internal employees, and um, yeah. Now we have a, a project, uh, 10,000 here. As I said, we have 1,800 um, members so far, and the, the goal is to yeah, make it broader to get 10,000. So on the one hand, really this uh, model gets more known and gets uh, more established. On the other hand, of course, that would help to finance uh, Fanopoli and the, uh, yeah, the necessary developments that uh, are still to be done for the platform, um, because in the end, it's, it's good to have this example, to have it alive, but uh, it must become a success. Um, otherwise, it will be uh, will get into history as a theoretical idea. And yeah, we want to prove that it's possible to have a successful business with those values and with those mechanisms inside the company DNA. So that's it. I'm really surprised there were no questions so far. Uh, maybe the party was really good last night, but uh, <laughs> if you have questions, then I'll be happy now. Yes. Um, yeah, you can ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I have a few questions. Um, first of all, you mentioned the management board, so I wanted to know if workers can join them of the management board. And also, how many workers do you have? Ah, okay. So currently, oh, more questions? I have one more, but maybe it okay, will depend will on your start. answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, currently they are 13 to 15 people who work in Berlin. You cannot count them fully because uh, yeah, a lot of them are part-time. They need to earn their life on <laughs> other um, yeah, projects they do. Um, it's also difficult to say because there's a lot, a lot of people joining it, a lot of people leaving. It's difficult for the employees, obviously, but uh, I think the total number of 12 to 15 is something that is quite stable or has been quite stable over the last year. And um, yeah, the, the employees can join uh, any of those um, uh, organs. That has also been the case so far. So. Um, for example, in the supervisory board that was newly uh, selected some days ago, there is, um, no, she just left the company, <laughs> but uh, she was in the company when she joined the management board, and in, there are three of them, and in the old um, supervisory board, two of them were also employees of the company, only one was externally um, busy, so, yeah, and of course, the, the management board is that's automatically uh, people who work inside the company because, um, yeah, this, this point number eight um, gets an assembly of all the employees and among themselves they, uh, select, they elect the management board. They cannot elect anyone who's coming from the outside, but uh, only from their own circle. Yeah, now that I say it, might be interesting in some years to see if they might even want someone external, but yeah, so far, that's the, that's the rule. And so what's your daily decision-making structure? Meaning, for daily decisions, how do you take decisions or collectively, like, are there several departments with heads, or do you all have the same hierarchical level, or how do you structure your team? Okay. Um, yeah, first, I'm not working in the team, so I, I have some insights, but uh, rather 99% than 100%. Um, with the, this low number of, of people, of course, they are very flat. Um, I think there's, in some departments, there's one hierarchical level. For example, the, the Anna, the woman who is responsible for the product development, she's the head of all the technical developers and so on. Or they're looking for a head of marketing. 
But that's, um, yeah, that's quite everything I know concerning heads. Um, so they, they have the idea to stay really flat in the hierarchies. And then how are decisions made? Well, that depends. Um, I mean, in the end, it's the employees themselves who make really operative decisions in their own business. And everything that goes beyond that is the daily business of the management board, so to say. I know that they involve their employees a lot, um, not because they need, but because they think it's wise. Um, in the end, it's the employees who have to work with those, with a campaign, for example, on a daily basis. So uh, there would be no sense in just deciding that and then telling the employees. Um, so they do that a lot, but um, there's no really a, not really a structure, a structural um, mechanism to do that. And that will be a big challenge once it grows bigger, but um, that might be one of the reasons why one day the management board will get paid better than the average because they have <laughs> the task to uh, think about how they do that. Yeah, well, um, I, have a, I have a question also. Uh, half of the profit, as you outlined, goes uh, away from the company, and of course some of the profit is going to go to whatever governments are overseeing the country people happen to be in. Is uh, that sustainable for a lot of companies? Um, yeah, we hope so. I mean, those are all um, profits after taxes, so if the company, if the German Fanopoli marketplace needs a relaunch with investments that will be before taxes. That will reduce this overall profit that will be distributed in the way that I presented. So I think necessary uh, investments in the business are not concerned because they come before you even define how much is the profit. Um, profit is, so to say, really what is available to give it away so yeah we think i mean in the end it's even four quarters who are given away from the company and that should be sustainable maybe i should add something that i didn't mention of course there are yeah, some regulations in the german law um, you have to yeah, accumulate certain funds before you uh, give away all your uh, all the money that you earn so um, there's even a mechanism in the statutes that says that, what was the numbers? Half of the profits have to be uh, put aside until I think 20% of the overall capital is reached um, before you can really um, yeah, give the money away. So I think that should assure that it's sustainable. Uh, perhaps I've missed this, um, but I think you haven't actually said what uh, Fairnopoly was founded as, as in, in terms of legal form. I mean, probably you cannot go to the Finanzamt and ask to found as a cooperative 2.0, right? So is this a cooperative? Fairnopoly is a cooperative, yes. Okay. Yes, Fernopoli is a cooperative. It was founded on December 12 of 2012. The session was opened at 12. Uh, 12. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's a registered um, cooperative since around one year. And so the founders, they have probably some shares too, but uh, they don't have any formal influence anymore. So how many of those points that they could are actually extras uh, on top of the legal form of a cooperative? Because I, I think, I'm not an expert, but I think that sort of this um, democratic distribution of decisions and transparency, these are already in that legal form. Uh, no, they're not in the legal form yet. I mean, you have um, corporations in Germany, uh, very known companies where you probably wouldn't uh, know they are um, But they're not, a, they're not cooperatives. No, I, I'm talking of cooperatives that don't act like cooperatives anymore. Um, I don't know, do you know? Can they do that? Uh, formally, they act like cooperatives, but what I want to say is that you cannot uh, distinguish them from big uh, stock companies. Um, so their but I thought is not that that legal form was in place exactly to prevent them from acting as a, as a different legal form. No, that's, that's the idea. 
Yeah, that's why we think that this legal form is a good point to start, but it takes all those um, attributes to, that you need to add on to really make sure it doesn't only start uh, in a fairer and more sustainable way, but it will also remain like this in 10, 20, or how many years ever. I mean, all those companies that I think about, um, like Edeka or Oreve, big supermarket companies uh, in Germany, um, cannot distinguish them much from their uh, totally privately held competitors. And I think when they started, they were different, but yeah, they grew. Some generations of people working there uh, went uh, and, and gone, and now you can't distinguish them anymore. And that's why we think it's necessary to add so many features to really make it, yeah, to really so make those mechanisms sure. So I noticed that you didn't mention a cap to the profits. And I think in many countries, I'm not sure about Germany, but in many countries, cooperatives are not allowed to make more than so many, so much profit. And everything else that they make has to go to a state fund for new cooperatives to start up, etc. Is that not the case in Germany? No. That's not the case in Germany. Would this probably be the problem with the cooperative legal form? If you put that in, you wouldn't need so much more regulation? That would solve uh, some of the problems, yes, the whole investor uh, and speculation issue. But uh, it, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't say anything about whether the companies are obliged to choose green solutions for banking, for electricity, and so on. Or the right, way that, that is new, absolutely. Treat. Sure. Or open source. Or open source, yeah. And could you repeat your question before? Because there was one really interesting point, which I don't remember now. Uh, which question? Sorry, the last one? Yes. In, about capping the profits? Capping the profits, yes, uh, so, uh, exactly. Um, uh, I don't think this will be a problem. Um, formally, you don't have limits in Germany for that. But I think if you have one paragraph um, that says you have to treat everyone in a fair way, then you cannot um, generate profits that your customers have to pay in the end that are totally uh, this dimensional. So that might be a luxurious problem, but I... Yeah, exactly, but this goes in the other way around. So instead of inser inserting a rule that says you have to be fair, you make sure that you automatically don't have any motive not to be fair. Sorry? Sorry, uh, you basically put in, in the system a mechanism that just simply doesn't reward unfair behavior instead of just having a rule in your statute. Yeah, or yeah. Well, that's why we, we do this, um, this second balance sheet. Um, but here we are on the, on the level of a company. Of course, the problem behind is that today those companies who uh, yeah, do unfair uh, Stuff, they are rewarded for that. If they manage to uh, lower the prices and someone else pays um, for that with the health or whatever issues, then this company has a competitive advantage. And that's why we need it currently. Of course, it would be a lot more direct to change the overall frame of the economy, then we wouldn't uh, need that. But uh, yeah, we cannot do that. Uh, our point is to start here. We would like not to have to do that, but at the moment we don't see how we could change this overall frame. Other questions? Uh, just another question about FAIR. Um, I understand that your mechanism can ensure a quite democratic management and interesting redistribution of wealth, but how would you prevent your company, as you said, because some cooperatives changed among, uh, during time, right? How would you prevent your company to uh, abandon fair objectives, so to say? Because you have a paragraph saying we should act in a fair way, but fair doesn't mean anything, meaning legally speaking or in terms of regulation, right? One, someone can say this is fair, someone can say this is not. So how do you, uh, let's say, how do you tackle this issue? Yeah, that's a, that's a valid point. I mean, now um, I would say that almost all, the, all of the 1,800 members do that because they like the model, because they themselves want to bring a fairer and more sustainable spirit into the economy. Um, we think this will basically remain like that, but uh, we don't know if tomorrow uh, the mainstream people discover that model and uh, in two days they don't care about it anymore. 
it can be changed theoretically, but in, in practice, yeah, those regulations are really difficult to change. And yeah, in the end, it's the, the management board who has to decide in the daily work what does FAIR mean, um, but they don't only have to decide, they also have to make that transparent and public. Um, they even have the right to do something unfair if they judge it necessary. They just have to say why they do it, um, make it transparent so that everyone can comment it and ask questions, and then even that's okay. So we hope, we don't know it, but we hope that the mechanisms um, and the implication of the crowd of all the users will ensure that uh, even after some years and in a more anonymous structure, all those values will still be living. It's kind of a big experiment. I mean, we don't know. This hasn't been done before, but we have to try it. And um, so far, I only see that those employees who are there, they really stick to the values. All the, the members that I know stick to the values. And um, yeah, I hope that will be enough to uh, <laughs> ensure it over a long period of time. But we don't know with 100%. Certainty. Other questions? Uh, thanks. Just to clarify, so you have three groups of people interested, uh, involved in the management of the, the company. Users, workers, and uh, cooperants, or people with um, uh, money interest uh, top uh, at uh, 25,000 euros. Mm -hmm. So they have each uh, uh, right to decide different things. For example, how do you become a worker? Do workers say, oh, we can become a worker or not? Or are you um, obliged to accept anybody? Because I've seen uh, several uh, uh, cooperative um, um, legal forms in several countries, and I see that the group dynamics that are generated are the... the um, the failing, give the failing mode of the different uh, things, and, and that's the, mm, how do you do it? How, for example, that worker question, that the worker point. Uh, how do you become a worker in uh, your company? I would say that you basically become a worker in the company like in, in any other company. They have job postings on the internet side, you have to apply, and then you are chosen in a process. So um, I would say basically everyone can become a volunteer helper, but to become a worker with a, with a legal contract, uh, you have to do it like in any, any other company in Germany. Um, so it could become a kind of a small club, you know, a small gentleman's club that um, help each other to, to the board and close, its, uh, close itself to, uh, to the outside world. At the same time, I don't say that uh, that's a good thing because, for example, I believe in Spain, if you are if you are a volunteer three times, the um, the assembly is automatically obliged to accept you as a new uh, worker. So that makes other implications because they have different uh, difficulty managing uh, everybody. Um, but uh, there's a, a fairness question there. Um, that's my point. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood all the, the, the aspects of your question right. I mean, those volunteers, they are really voluntary. And there's, there's one person inside the core team who, yeah, who, who is in contact with them, who, yeah, who tells or who they can ask what is the right thing to do. Um, there are some things that, they, that you can do limitedly, like uh, distributing flyers. Things like that, but of course, if you want to help programming the code, then uh, yeah, that has to work with the, the work that is done. You can fix bugs where they are put on the platform, for example, but uh, if you program a feature that is not uh, um, necessary, I mean, there's no, no point in doing that. And this closed circle uh, aspect, um, I mean, that's the same in, in every company apply, people are employed, people leave one day. Uh, yeah, maybe it needs another innovation for that too, but so far we handle that like everyone else. And I don't know if in your first question you also asked uh, on the, the cooperative itself. Um, there, basically everyone can become a member. However, um, the, the management board also has the right to refuse people. So 
let's say we have a scenario where strange things happen, a lot of uh, new people, and they belong to the same company who's a competitor, and uh, you know, uh, you have the feeling something is going wrong, and then they can say no. Um, but so far, uh, everyone who, who just filled out a form uh, could become a member of the cooperative. So far, we want to have as many people as possible, but uh, if something is looking strange, we can yeah, stop. Okay. Any other questions? Well, it's a lot of interesting things to think about. Um, how to form a more fair society. And uh, yeah, as you say, it's, it's an ongoing experiment and I hope a lot of people do it in, uh, in good faith. Well, thanks for that great talk. Yeah, thank you very much.